Hello everyone and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. Now today we'll be dealing with the unthinkable. It's horrible to have to even be addressing this problem as it just shouldn't happen but unfortunately this is the world we live in and we're going to be talking about child abuse. My guests today are survivors of abuse and they are Samantha Merritt and also sisters Diane Ginn and Chris Tuck. Now they're all here today to share their story and I have to say they're very brave for coming on the program today to talk about it but they're doing this for a reason and that's because they want to help you at home and to prove to you that there is life after abuse. We'll also be hearing your voice on whether or not you think enough is being done about child abuse and we'll find out what the different types of abuse are. But let's first go to Samantha Merritt. Samantha, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about this very sensitive subject. But before you go into your story, tell me why did you feel it was really important to come on the show and be so open about what happened to you? Because I think people like myself who are survivors need to speak out and give people inspiration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you believe then there is life after being abused? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. So let, let's go back now to when uh, the abuse first happened. What was your, what were your first memories? Um, I was around the age of six mm -hmm. when it first happened, um, which I knew was wrong, even so very young. Um, and unfortunately, it was a family member right. who obviously abused, you know, my trust. And was it someone that you really loved and you trusted? And yes, it was, yeah. Someone you were comfortable around up until that point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not so easy even now to talk about, you know, in detail. Mm -hmm. But if it helps people, you know, because I feel that people need to talk out to help other people, yeah. to give them inspiration, like I said, um, to, to basically stay positive. And mm -hmm. it's not always their fault, you know, when people do this t to young children. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell, tell us what happened that first time from what, what you remember then. I came home from school and he was waiting in the living room. Mm -hmm. And um, he locked the door and forcefully grabbed me and... He grabbed both of my arms and I remember being pushed onto the sofa and it was quite an old farmhouse that I lived in as a child mm -hmm. and he basically made me touch him in his genital areas to start with and he kept saying, be quiet, don't speak. So don't were there other nothing. people, other maybe family members nearby? Yes, okay. yes there was. Um, but it was a very large house, so, and he sent the dog to guard the door also, oh, I remember. So, so it had it well thought out, basically, oh, what yes. I was going to do. Yeah. And I, felt, I remember feeling physically sick and mm. just shaking and thinking, what, what's, what's happening? Why is this happening to me? And I just froze. I just froze because mm. it was just so out of the blue. And I remember the radio in the background and, and basically that was it for the first time, you know. Okay. Now, do you remember if he was kind of um, trying to groom you in any way and trying to make you feel secure with him or trying to befriend you in an unusual way before that or was that just the first time that kind of hit you out of the blue like that? I always felt uncomfortable in his presence, but mm. I didn't really notice anything other maybe he was looking at me in a sexual way. I don't know, because I never thought of things like that because I was so young and innocent. Yeah, yeah. It would never enter my mind to think of him looking at me in any other way. I just had a that's vibe actually, of... That's actually a really good point, I have to say, for, for mums or parents that, that are watching, that if your child does seem uncomfortable, says they're uncomfortable around a person, that's not to go and accuse them of doing anything, obviously, because you don't know, but it's just something to watch out for, isn't it? Mm. It's very something very subtle, but it could be something there, right? It's first sign, I suppose, first that sign, for me, yeah. that I never picked up on that. I just felt uncomfortable. Yeah. So, wow. Okay, so then was that an isolated case or did this continue with this, this person? This continued over a period of two years. Wow, gosh. Um, and I was too scared to say anything because I was told that if I spoke up about what was happening, mm -hmm. 
I would be sent away to an orphanage, basically. And back, I believe, in the 70s and 80s, children were seen and not heard. You know, that's what I believe. If yeah. you spoke up, we were thought of, oh, she's after attention, send her to a room. And, and that was how it was, unfortunately. So I was just too scared to say anything to anybody until... So you didn't try, like, were no. there times when you wanted to, like, say, and then you held it in? Of course, yeah, when there was a room full of adults that, you know, around and wanted to say that. Yeah. So I think it immediately affected my behaviour because mm. I started to wet the bed and skip school. I was very disobedient. Mm -hmm. I was daydreaming, crying, shaking. Um, would have freezing cold baths in the middle of the night with nobody, nobody knowing that I would do this and put bottles of TCP in to make me feel clean oh my gosh. at the age of six because... Yeah. I wanted to wash any evidence mm -hmm. away, so... When did the, the abuse stop then? Um, I was 11 years old at that particular setting when that abuser stopped. But unfortunately, it continued on to other settings that I lived in. With the same, the no. same person, with different people? A diff six other abusers. Six? Goodness. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Gosh, it's really... You're doing really well, by the way. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking about it. You're doing an excellent job because I know, I know it's uncomfortable to hear and I'm sorry if, if anyone's feeling uncomfortable, but I really think it's important to, to open up about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when, when the abuse first started with the, the first person, um, what was going through your mind? How, did you, how were you feeling about yourself? Were you, were you blaming yourself in any way? Because this is what I hear from people sometimes that have been abused, that they somehow think it's, it's their fault and obviously it's never their fault. Did you ever have any thoughts like that? I didn't know what to think. I've just felt confused, just mm -hmm. very confused as why. I thought I'd done something wrong. I thought I'd done something wrong straight away and... You're blaming yourself. Blaming myself, mm -hmm. of course. And I remember going to the cupboards and drinking bottles of vinegar and thinking perhaps that'll take the pain from the inside. You know, that'll mm -hmm. take the pain away. Um, but I just sort of blame myself and like you say just thought why me I was just confused why mm -hmm. is it me so I immediately asked for my hair to be cut off and started dressing like a boy so, so you that wouldn't you wouldn't be noticed like. noticed mm -hmm. and, and thinking if I dress like my brother perhaps I'd be left alone if I had my hair cut short and wore boy clothes and you know behave mm -hmm. like a boy didn't want the normal girl things the princess shoes or yeah. glittery pink things i just sort of went into the boyish tomboy mode because thinking yeah. perhaps they'll stay away from me this is all um what the things that you're describing here the, for people that are watching these are all little signs that you can pick mm -hmm. up because sometimes you might look at a child and think god that child's really naughty don't listen but we don't know what could be going on behind closed doors and what, there's always a, a reason mm -hmm. for that kind of behaviour or that maybe the child is really, really quiet. There's always some kind of explanation for it, isn't there? We can't just Definitely. dismiss and say, oh, it's just the child, it's just mm -hmm. the way they've been brought up. It could be something much more serious. It could be. But everybody's yeah. behaviour reflects on you know, the way they are, something that's happened to make them behave in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, Samantha, you said there were six other mm -hmm. abusers. Now... Mm -hmm. Was this an organised thing or were these separate no. occasions? These were separate occasions. Can you just briefly tell um, us about that? One incident, I was tied to a tree in the middle of a forest and there were several of them. Um, another one was... But they didn't, all these people didn't know each other? No. Another one was um, a young man that pinned me to the bed and put his hand over my mouth. Okay. You don't need to go into any more, any more details, Samantha, but with this pattern that was happening, what, in your head, how were you kind of reasoning it out? Were you like, how come am I sort of just attracting this, this, this attention? What, what, were you, what were you going through? Because you must have been wondering, hang on, why is this another person, a different person, not related to the mm -hmm. other one? Mm -hmm. It's happening again. What, what was going on in your head? Or had you just gone numb by then, like just I, blanked it out? I'd seen a psychiatrist by, by the age of six mm -hmm. and the report was that I was already traumatised so severely and I was emotionally blocked at such a young age because of the first incident. So do you think um, perpetrators could pick mm -hmm. up on that? I was numb. I was an easy target. 
I was just numb to any emotions whatsoever. Right. I, I couldn't show any emotions. I couldn't... I always enjoyed the attention for feeling centre of attention, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to be loved. Because yeah. I, I'd not grown up in a normal family background. Mm -hmm. So coming from a broken family, I always wanted the love. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I assumed this is how they are showing me the love from doing this to me. Oh, so gosh, the second see, time, is this yeah. the normal? Am I the one that's thinking this is wrong? Is it normal? So, and that's how, unfortunately, it continued. I'm just going to go to a break, but I'd like to, um, after the break, I'm going to ask you, I'd like you to explain when you actually realised that it wasn't normal, and also when, when you had finally had the courage to actually open up about what you were going through, because I think that's, a, that's an important point, because mm -hmm. maybe there are people at home watching that have never spoken up about what's happened to them, mm -hmm. and they're suffering in silence. But do join us after this. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show, always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. Now, before we go back to Samantha's story, let's take a look at what you guys on the streets of London had to say about if enough is being done about child abuse. Do you think enough is being done about child abuse? Relatively, I don't actually think so. Um, for them to actually start doing something is to make a huge awareness about child abuse and what it actually is. Like, I come from Ireland, but I haven't come in to visit here um, in the UK a lot. There's a lot of mixed cultures. And being African, you know, as you're growing up in an African neighborhood, you get smacked if you do something wrong, all those sort of things. So when you're in a, living in a country with a huge, huge, huge mixed amount of cultures, the government should educate themselves on how these people bring up their children. Everybody knows what it's like to live up in an African community or vice versa. And by doing so, they'll be able to reach out to these people in a way that they would understand, in their language, if you understand. I don't mean they have to be speaking in a different tongue, but to be able to do something about child abuse, they need to be able to understand the huge majority or minority groups that bring up their children very differently but in the same culture that they would back home. Um, I don't think enough is being done about child abuse. I think it's taken too lightly. I think a lot of people think it just goes on in the world. It happens to almost everywhere, so what's the point in doing anything about it? I think there should be more done, like more campaigns, more things, more advocate groups, etc. Yeah. I think in the news at the moment, I think it's a good thing that it's come to the fore, whereas 20 or 30 years ago you wouldn't hear so much. So I think the more that people know about it, obviously that's much better in the first case, so that we can be more aware and everybody has to take part in it. But I think that with these things there's always more that can be done, but at least I think we're moving in the right direction. And we're more aware of it, so that's got to be a good thing as a first step. I wouldn't say so. I think there's been a high level government cover up going right to the top and it's only being uncovered now all, all everything that's rotten to the core about it and I think we'll find out there'll be more and more and more going from the top level downwards I mean we've got we've had um, lots of sort of names that we've grown up with like Rolf Harris and um, you have Gary Glitter you have all these famous people but it does seem like there is um, some kind of high level cover-up going up do you think um, child abuse should be dealt with differently according to the different types of abuse that there are, whether it's emotional abuse, physical abuse, do you think they should be treated differently? Mm, I've never really given it a great deal of thought, I must admit, but I can't see how it can be different. I think the only thing is physical abuse is much easier to see because the evidence is there. Um, it's less obvious in terms of emotional abuse. Um, so really, I don't know how you would actually diagnose that as well as physical abuse. That's got to be the easiest way. But in terms of how they should be treated, no, I don't think there's any difference. Being a mum, obviously. Yeah. Um, no, all abuse is abuse. So um, like they should, they both or all of them should not be taken lightly, whether it's sexual abuse or physical or mental. Um, I just think that like they should have more therapy for it, for all types of abuse, because any abuse is abuse. Okay, thanks very much. So now we're going to go back to Samantha. So Samantha's been telling us about the horrible experiences that she went through. She was abused the first time at six years of age and then 
afterwards she went on to be abused by another six different people completely unrelated because as you said you you felt you became an easy target because you were cold you it's like you'd gone numb mm -hmm. so you were a very easy target for for the perpetrators now you mentioned something very important is that you thought um, you started to think maybe this is normal because it keeps happening to me maybe it's just the way things are meant to be but there was obviously a, a time when you realized that it wasn't normal when can you tell us about that time the particular times when I was forced and the hand went over my, my mouth and I was pinned to the bed mm -hmm. because it was so forceful that I knew this this can't be right why would somebody want to hurt me in this way mm -hmm. and I remember going to the bathroom early hours and just shaking and crying and thinking, you know, this can't be the way that people show love to a child. You don't hurt something that you love mm -hmm. or somebody that you love. So the logic mm -hmm. sort of kicked in at that point. Of course. When did you actually speak up about it? Um, I was um, around the age of 12 and I spoke to somebody I trusted put my trust in them and mm -hmm. and they believed me which was so important yeah. to me to mm -hmm. to be believed that this is not a cry for attention this really went on so and that's where unfortunately when I was believed and removed from the last setting that I was living at at the time all the hormones were kicking in because I was just starting to be a teenager then mm -hmm. and boys started to get interested at high school yeah. and that was when I found it the most difficult emotionally because I didn't want the attention then mm -hmm. why why would all these boys be coming around me do they want the same as what those people wanted from me mm. so I found that very difficult and sank into a very dark place and I didn't realize at the time that you know, that was depression, it was a yeah. very severe state of depression mm -hmm. because of the flashbacks were still happening, we still have them to this day. I don't think you, you'll ever erase the mind. I wish we, we could have, a, you know, a magic button that we could erase the mind. So, unfortunately, I'd locked them away, even though I'd mm. spoken up about what happened, I was yeah. still locking away my emotions and how I felt. I still didn't open up fully. But even though, when you actually did speak up about it, were you getting any kind of help at that point or was it just the fact that you just spoke to someone and then that was kind of enough at the time yeah. to kind of for you to move on? Yeah, they just spoke and, and it was just told to be quiet and it was all brushed underneath the carpet. Oh gosh. But although they believed me, they yeah. didn't want to take anything further. Okay, but then you did, something was done eventually and you, did you get counselling afterwards for no. anything? You didn't? No. Um, I unfortunately tried to take my own life at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. I got a razor blade and cut all my wrists and took several bottles of tablets and cut my face with a razor blade, over 40 cuts to my face and again cut my hair short again mm -hmm. because that was the way I felt that well, I didn't want to live, basically. I felt unloved and dirty and mm -hmm. worthless, so. Well, when, when did you feel, because today you, you do have a partner mm -hmm. and you have children as mm -hmm. well. So there must, be, must have been a point, obviously it was horrific things that happened to you, but there was a point where there was a turnaround and you did feel like you could have a life. Mm -hmm. when, when did that point come for you? Um, when I met my partner at 16. Mm -hmm. Um, he was my rock because I opened up straight away and felt trust and loved finally so so it's good that you weren't put off completely because then there was an opportunity for you to to be happy wasn't there yeah there was but I always wanted the fairy tale you know the mm -hmm. white wedding the husband the children that's all I ever wanted so mm -hmm. and I was lucky that I found that so very young and I yeah. think at a crucial time where things could have been so different when I mm -hmm. felt so unloved and you know in a very dark place so it, okay. I believe that my path of having my children and meeting my partner at the time yeah was a blessing okay and how, how are things for you today I still suffer with the flashbacks mm -hmm. like I say you'll never ever you know 
get over emotionally. I think we'll always have that locked away. Whether, even if you go to see a counsellor or you speak to people in the family or loved ones, I think we'll always have that little bit that's locked away to keep us sane. That's how high I feel. Mm -hmm. um, so. Although, Samantha, um, I know obviously there are many women that feel that way, but I also know, I've spoken to other women that have been through abuse as well, but they've, even though, for example, they don't forget what happened, but it doesn't affect them in their life anymore today. So they, you know, they've, they've described being happy and mm -hmm. being at peace after it's happened. So I suppose each person's case is different, mm -hmm. but it is also possible to, you know, even though the, the memories are there, but for them not to be painful anymore, according to what I've heard, because I've, I've, you know, thankfully I've never been through anything like that. But I talk to, to a lot of people and I know, you know, there is um, definitely hope and happiness even after something like that's, that's happened to you. Yeah, definitely. So I don't think anyone should also stop searching for that. No. Because it's always possible. Well, definitely. yeah, like I said, I found that I'm happy. I've got my mm -hmm. three children and, you know, I'm very lucky that that is gone. And I don't live in the past. I'm not a negative person. I'm yeah. a very positive person. I'm a very happy person, mm -hmm. which has helped me definitely helped me get through and my motto growing up was that there's always somebody worse off than myself mm -hmm. so that's you know okay. that's how I what feel. What are your future plans would you say? Grandchildren. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah my daughter's just graduated. So. Really? Yeah. Oh so. my gosh <laughs> you look younger I didn't think <laughs> Oh that's great. Well you're going to stay with us because we're also going to bring on two sisters who are also going to be very brave today and speak about their experience and like, like we said this is a, a, a difficult topic to speak about. I think Samantha's done a brilliant job but it's something that we need to address because the, the aim of this program is to help you at home that maybe you know you've been through this and you, you can't imagine speaking to anyone about it. It's like you've locked it away. You're trying to deal with things. Maybe you're, you're doing other things to try and forget what's happened. But it is something that you do need to speak about. If you want to be free from it, the first step is to actually speak about it. So we've got two lovely sisters, Diane and Chris, that are coming on after the break to share their story too and give you some hope. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. All right, folks, we're back talking about a very sensitive subject, but one that needs to be addressed, and that's child abuse. So now I have sisters Diane Ginn with me and also Chris Tuck. Hello, ladies. Hi, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Again, it's very brave of you to come and speak about this, but I'm so glad you're here because I believe after this program, many women, many people that have been abused are going to open up about it and get help. So let's start with uh, you, Chris. What was, what was your experience? Um, obviously, we were brought up in the same household with my two brothers as well, and we were neglected emotionally, physically, and sexually abused by two sets of parents, step-parents. Mm -hmm. um, my abuse happened outside the home. Right. Again, like Sam said, you're looking for love and you're not getting it in the home, um, in our instance. So when someone outside of the home showed me the love, um, groomed me, that's when my sexual assault happened. He made me touch his penis and mm -hmm. I still don't like penises to this day, so it's really scarred me quite badly. I've got two kids, but um, sex life is hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Chris, when, when you say, um, if just, <coughs> just for the benefit of the viewers at home, when you say that you were groomed, can you, can you describe how, how that happened um, briefly? Nine years old, um, constantly told day in, day out at home that you're, you're ugly, you're not worthy, you're, um, no one's going to love you, and being beaten at the same time. So it reinforces the message. Um, right. So when someone outside of the home where he parked his van, a minibus, he drove for a school, and he would say, can you look after the van for me, like, to just to get, you know, interest in us. Yeah. Um, would you like some sweets? We never got anything like that. So he so groomed So the tension us, that you, want, yeah, you were craved. craving. Yeah, we got it from this particular yeah. man. Not Diane, me and um, someone else. And um, eventually... Did he I, know what you were going through, what you'd been through? 
I think? think they can smell vulnerable children yeah. a mile off. They, they, mm. Especially if they live locally, they can see your patterns of living and that you're always on the street. And Because we basically got kicked out of the morning and told not to come back to tea time. So we had to make ourselves busy during the day. So yeah. we, 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 we were street kids. We just hung around the streets, okay. really. Um, so he knew this. And basically, over a period of months, he... Um, Sweets um, got our trust and I ended up in his house one day and I knew like Sam that that was wrong but I trusted him to a point and that's when the sexual assault happened on myself. Okay and now was that an isolated case or did that continue? No well? that was an isolated case but mm -hmm. the abuse within the home was continuous. Okay and how about with you Diane? Well, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, or anything, and when did your abuse start? Because obviously you both had it in the house. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mum basically, my mum left when we were five, and we had a stepmom, and then she used to not feed us. We used to go and raid bins for food and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, another family member sexually abused me. I don't really remember that, because I was only about five or six. Did you ever talk to each other about it? No, no not really. really. No. no. Because That's we were just so used to being... Treated. I mean, was ill. We we was emotionally ill treated. Like you're ugly, you stink. I mean, we used to, I used to wear the bed, and I used to stink, and I used to go to school. That's where I'm going on. Okay. <laughs> I used to go to school, and of course, kids at school, because you you're dirty. You can't. You hold your clothes. You you, know, you smell. We never had a bath or anything. I used to smell of weeds. We weren't allowed to bath or wash. You weren't the allowed kids, to. No, I don't think I ever had a bath for about four years. We were very well, we were badly neglected and yeah, um, the kids at school we just stinks. can't believe that the school didn't do anything no. about it, to be truthful, no. to be perfectly blunt. We were, we were neglected and we, we were bullied at school for, I for I'm, it. I'm, I'm gobsmacked really, I don't it even know. It happens still today, yeah, they're, we're they're, not, yeah. it's not isolated. No, still kids at school, you see, a stink, I mean, we did and of course the kids at school hated us and we were bullied at school as well. So on uh, top of everything else that was going yeah, on at home, yeah. then you had to face the, the bullying yeah, and everything that was, that was going on at just felt worthless, and stupid, again, ugly. The signs were overlooked again. These, yeah. Yeah. these signs that I was yeah. saying to you they earlier. Just don't care. Yeah. You know, these should be picked up. These yeah. are professional people. Yeah. They're working with these children, especially in schools. Of course. So why Please, is this overlooked? teachers, anyone that's watching the yeah. show that are, you know you work in schools or anything, we can't ignore these signs. It's not just a case of a parent not knowing how to look after their child. All right. Rare cases, yes. It might be that, you know, it's a new parent, they don't really know what they're doing yet, but come on. But we used to, there's, steal, there's, yeah. we used to steal food at school as well, didn't we? Yeah, food, we used to steal out of yeah. shops, and again, we knew stealing We used to go to wrong, the school bins. But if and you're hungry, steal, you're used to steal hungry. apple cores from the school bins. Why is it that you, you think you never spoke to each other about what you were going through? Do you, um, were you told, like, you know, if you say anything, as in Samantha's case? Because we was that's the it. four of us, sexual abuse, you don't, you don't because it's... So that's not the home. It was just another thing that happened to you. On top of everything else. Yeah, thing. yeah. I mean, I went into hospital when I was eight because I was mal, 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 mal nourished. I was spent six months in hospital, but it was the best six months of my life because I was fed, I was happy, oh, I had clothes. Yeah. But then my um, my mum came back on the scene and she had another husband. And but he used to come in and he used to sit me on his knee. He used to come to hospital and see me, sit me on his knee, be really nice to me. And then we went back to live with my mum. Then he used to. But go by, can I say this? We used to go play hide and seek in the park. Of course, he used to take me with him. Mm -hmm. And the time he was doing this, he started touching me and saying, if you say anything to anyone, you'll go back to your stepmom. And being touched by him was better than going back to, go to back her. To the abuse of the stepmom, yeah. Yeah, and then um, she used to wonder where would gone with him because they used to say I'm his favourite. And he actually, I, can't, I don't know if I can say this, he actually, um, he wrote me once when I was nine. Mm. It didn't last long because she came along long after and she nearly caught him. Of course, you don't say anything. Did, felt you, did you not speak about it then either? Well, or I, did you I didn't know she had been raped until we, we sat down and we wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Because right. that's when we found out the abuse that all of us had suffered. And, 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 and we're like, if only we'd just spoken together, we might have been a united voice and we might, have, we might have done something. But we each felt that we were each protecting. I felt like I was protecting all of them and went on my brother felt the same. Okay. So we never spoke. So, But we thought that if we took what we took, that we would be preventing yeah. them from being abused. But yeah. it wasn't. Mm. 
And my work with a lot of other survivors is the same thing. They all yeah. think they're protect by taking the abuse themselves, they think they're protecting yeah. their siblings and oh they're not gosh. because most people are being abused. Yeah. If there's an abusive yeah. person in, in, in that house. environment, mm -hmm. you're more than likely that everybody's being abused in some way. Gosh. Not always, but yeah. yeah. But it's very likely. Yeah. Yeah. But I told her I told her, when I was fourteen, I said she I told when I was fourteen I told her that he'd touch me. But I didn't she go didn't to tell me the right. She took me to the police station and reported him, but it's my word against his. No, that's interesting. Nothing ever why, happened. Why with your sister, um, for example, you, you went to the police, but when it was happening to you, you didn't feel like you could? Is that, is that right? Because you were protective over your sister. I was because my mum left when I was seven and she was five. I yeah. become the mum. Okay. okay. I was abused by someone outside of the home. I didn't know so that. So she didn't know that. Okay. But I was acting like Sam, I was acting weird. So my dad and my stepmom actually took me down to the police station and I've said this many times before, but the actual um uh investigation that they did to me, the personal investigation that they then did, mm -hmm. the internal ser uh, search that they did was more horrific oh, for gosh. me yeah. than the abuse, mm -hmm. the sexual assault that just happened. And that stays with that's me, right. that okay. pain stays with me more today yeah, than the actual sexual assault yeah, in the yeah. first place. Yeah, that, that's not nice. Yeah. It's not nice. I had that twice, because my, my first person that abused me, I was six, I had to have, go and have an internal. He'd only ever touched me, but I still had to have an internal then. Mm. And I didn't know what was happening, no one said nothing to me, they just no, took me in there. they just take you in there and just did it. And I know now that that's not right, but that's what happened to us in the yeah. um, 70s and 80s. Okay. Well, I mean, thank goodness things have changed a lot today, haven't they? Even you were saying to me earlier, Samantha, that, you know, there's sort of, for children now, there's a lot of things up and posters up in child line and all, all sorts of things where people can get help. So things have mm. progressed in some way, but obviously a lot more does need to be done. Yeah, but it was still okay. There was a case not long ago. It was um, on the news. There was a little boy. He died, but he he'd been he'd been getting thinner and thinner. And go, I can't say his name, but he'd been getting thinner and thinner mm. and going to school. And the teacher had noticed it and they'd taken photographs of him. And this was in the last couple of years, and he died. Yeah. He died from yeah. abuse, but he wasn't fed, and he was he was stealing food from the school. So again, they're ignoring the signs, but I know um, a friend of mine called Tom Perry from Mandate Now, he's trying to bring in mandatory reporting mm -hmm. so that teachers and or pe caregivers in all institutional settings have to report abuse yes, rather yeah. than maybe if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a law that seems to be dragging its feet, but that mm. is a law that we do need. We do need it, and not just even if you have proof of it, even if you suspect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because man, yeah. it's better to report something, even if you're not sure, but at least if there's something going on, that, that child yeah. is going to get help. And even if it, it doesn't go anywhere that time, if there's a log that's been built up, then there's mm. a case yeah, building exactly. all the time. You can see the pattern. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree Definitely. with that. I think when I left school, I went to college and became a nursery nurse and a child protection officer. And it was something that I felt I could do because I could spot the signs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I knew I was really good at what I did for 13 years. Mm -hmm. used to go into and school. it does, like you say, we can spot the signs, like you will spot the signs. And anybody who's been through something like this, yeah. we will know straight and away. Everyone needs to be educated at that. Mm -hmm. Everybody yeah. needs. Everyone, definitely. Definitely. All right, well, we're going to go to, to a break, ladies. But um, also, I want you to, after the break, girls, to talk about this book as well, Through the Eyes of a Child, um, which actually helped you at, at yeah. some point, didn't it? Yeah, but we're going to speak did. about that after this break. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show, always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back everyone. Now before we continue speaking to the ladies here, let's take a look at this video showing the different types of abuse. There are many forms of child abuse. Online abuse. Online abuse is any type of abuse that happens over the internet. This can be in the form of cyberbullying, grooming, sexual abuse and exploitation, or emotional abuse from people they know as well as strangers. Online abuse can occur solely online or in addition to occurring in the real world. As technology is everywhere, children and young people suffering from this form of abuse may feel trapped with nowhere to turn as it follows them everywhere they go, like their bedroom, 
which is meant to be a safe place for them. Grooming. Grooming is when an adult builds a connection with a child for the purpose of abusing and or exploiting them sexually. This can be done online, in the real world, by a stranger or someone they know. Sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is where a child is forced or persuaded into participating in any sort of sexual act and does not have to be physical. Sometimes the child may not be aware what is happening is abuse or that what is happening is wrong. Physical abuse. Physical abuse is deliberately hurting a child, thus causing injuries such as broken ribs, burns or cuts. They could be kicked, punched, slapped, poisoned, burned or have objects thrown at them. Babies can be shaken sometimes so violently it leads to their death. Neglect. Neglect is a continuous failure to provide the most basic needs to a child. Children left to go hungry, unbathed, or adequately clothed, sheltered, and supervised are all examples of neglected children. Neglect can also occur in the form of a parent or carer not protecting a child from other types of abuse. Bullying. Bullying is behavior that hurts someone else, such as name calling, hitting, pushing, spreading rumors, threatening or undermining someone. This can happen anywhere, even in their own home, and often over a long period of time. Emotional abuse, also known as psychological abuse, when a parent or carer is constantly maltreating or neglecting a child emotionally, which can involve deliberately trying to scare or humiliate a child, or isolating or ignoring them. Harmful sexual behaviour. Children and young people who develop harmful sexual behaviour harm themselves and others by using sexually explicit words and phrases, inappropriate touching, using sexual violence and threats, or engaging in full penetrative sex with other children or adults. Child sexual exploitation is another form of child abuse. Children and young people being sexually exploited are vulnerable people who have been tricked or manipulated into believing they are in a loving, safe relationship. They may be offered money or other rewards only to be trafficked into slavery. They may have been groomed online and become totally dependent on their abuser, making it even harder to leave. Trafficking children is also child abuse. Children can be trafficked for cheap labor, sexual abuse, domestic servitude, benefit fraud, and forced marriage. And I think that video was really, really important because maybe we have people watching now and you can't even imagine, never imagine that these types of things go on, even though you say, you know, you, I know you hear about child abuse and you see the helplines and everything, but to actually go into it and show the different types and what can actually happen to a child, I think is really important. And I hope it's been eye opening and also that you will keep your eyes open because I think it's everyone's responsibility. It's not just the teachers or, or you know, the, the workers, whatever. It, I think it should be everyone's responsibility to look after any child. So we all need to speak up if we notice or even suspect something. So let's go back to, to the ladies here that I've got on, on the sofa with me. So there was a point, Chris, where you, where you started writing a book. Why did you feel the need to do that? And you've got it here actually through the eyes of a child. I was um, in a happier place myself in my life with my children and happily married um, and I just felt that everybody kept saying to me, oh you're so happy, oh life must be really good and always must have been really good and I got quite peeved that everybody kept thinking that of me and I just thought if you only knew I had problems the same as you but mm. we can always be happier, we can always like you get the most out of life that we we can because we've only got one life and it's so short yeah. if we always live in um in our pain we're never gonna 
fulfill our own potential. So I thought if I share my story and I was trying to really help Diane to be truthful mm. um, and I thought if I, if I can tell our story then it will inspire people. Yeah. Um, and it has actually made me and my siblings, Diane and my two brothers, really quite close now. Okay. And everybody that has read our story or knows of our story does find it inspiring because it's not just a, a book about, you know, poor me, why me, look what I've been through. It's about mm. this happened, but your past doesn't define your future and you can actually go out and make your life mean something. Mm -hmm and you don't have to remain a victim, you can become a survivor. And for God's sake, we deserve to thrive in our life. Exactly, Why should yeah, we yeah. just survive mm -hmm. and be stuck in the pain that someone else has caused us mm -hmm. in our childhood? That's right. And yeah, I spent 15 years running from my past life. I left home at 15 and I wanted the house and money in the bank before I brought children in the world. I wanted mm -hmm. children, but I wanted everything right before yeah. I brought mm -hmm. children in the world, whereas Diane and my brothers and that, they all had children quite early and quite okay. quickly because they wanted something to love, but I wanted everything to be right for my children. Not saying that they're wrong, but mm. for me, I had to have that security yeah. and stability. And once I had that, I could then turn and help other people because yeah. I felt okay. Okay, you felt in a place that you yeah, were ready I just to, felt to a help place, others. Yeah. Okay. And also to show people that, yeah, just because we're happy, everyone's got a story to tell and every one story will help someone. Mm -hmm. mm. Definitely. That's why we're so open on the show as yeah. well. <laughs> so Diane, you, the book helped you. How, yeah, how did it um, help you? Because obviously, I used to think people, if they knew, obviously, parents, um, what happened, if they actually knew, they wouldn't like me. Because I used to think I had um, mm. dirty written on my forehead. So I used to walk around like that. Yeah. And um, I told my story and everyone said, oh, you're very, you're inspirational. And I've not, not had one bad word. And that's made me realise that it wasn't me. Yes. I'm not to blame, mm -hmm. and my story does help other people, and I've had lots of good feedback from that. Brilliant. That's, that's why I'm excellent. sitting here now. <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes before we have to go, but ladies, could tell us quickly about the organisation that you set up online as well. Um, basically, it's just called Survivors of Abuse, mm -hmm. and um, I actually run two workshops that help people releasing the shame of childhood abuse, which is really important because people don't realise mm -hmm. that the shame is not theirs and yes. it belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. And that's the first part of healing, really. Mm -hmm. And then the self-esteem workshop, which basically builds up. So by loving yourself, reinvesting in yourself, nurturing yourself, it's all about rebuilding and, and putting all the pieces back together to make you a healthier hold as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So um, Survivors of Abuse is really set up to deliver those two courses. Um, but just to raise awareness of the mm -hmm. after effects of abuse, how us adults are affected by it mm -hmm. and that there is life after abuse but you need to be responsible for yourself yeah. in, in a way that you speak up and then you find the help that you need because we're all different, we all, we all need different help. Yeah. Some yeah. people mm -hmm. need therapy, some people don't. Um, but you will be affected by your abuse in some way. It, you will be affected. I had mm -hmm. a breakdown when I was 30. Sam said she was suicidal, Diane was suicidal, both my brothers were suicidal, one did drugs. Anger management, massive problem, mm -hmm. huge problem. Um, my brother nearly lost his children because of his anger management, but it wasn't until the <coughs> social services spoke to him and said, why are you so angry? And he told them his story, yeah, yeah. that they gave him all the help, you know, which really? was fantastic, because I know brilliant. in some cases they don't give the help. Yeah. No. I was scared of that happening yeah. to me. I remember bleaching my house thinking nobody, what if a knock on the door on social services is going yeah. to take my baby away from me. Yeah. I was the opposite. I was yeah. very overprotective. Wouldn't mm. let my children sleep over at a young age at, mm. at people's houses because they were vulnerable, especially my girls. Yeah. And that's how, yeah, like I'm you say, the same we like I, don't yeah. think, I think we need to I do don't. a whole other show. But this is yeah. out of time, ladies. I don't oh, work sorry. because I don't trust nobody with my children. Really? Mm. I think we're going to have to do another show seriously about <laughs> this and because there's so many different there's things so that many. we can speak about and different yeah. things, so much. But we will definitely do, do something else on this because I think it's something that we need to keep addressing. Yeah. Thank you so much. You've all been brilliant, very brave. Thank you so much for coming on and, and you know, sharing what happened to you with the viewers. And I'm sure loads of people have been helped by it. You've been done brilliantly, all of you. All right, guys, so we have reached the end of the programme, but bottom line is please don't suffer in silence. There is help for you out there. There are plenty of organisations nowadays. You're not going to be judged, and as you heard, it's not your fault. Whatever happened is not your fault. You have nothing to be ashamed about. Like they said, the shame is, is on the perpetrators, not on you. 
Okay, so, you know, if you have been holding things in and you have, you know, you've never spoken, maybe you have a partner that doesn't even know what happened to you, but it's affecting your relationship that he doesn't know or she doesn't know what's going on. Speak, try speaking to them about it. You'll be surprised. Maybe you think you're not going to be understood or, you know, something like that. But you'll be surprised at how people will be supportive once you do open up about what's happened to you. And if you need my advice as well, you can email me on chris at chriscbshow.tv. And if you want more information about our guests and the organisation as well that they mentioned, you can visit the website chriscbshow.tv. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.